Welcome to the Bay Area Christian Church live stream. Today we've got a virtual fellowship Sunday where we'll have a short lesson continuing on the topic of unity. And after the lesson, send out a Zoom link to a small group of friends to get some fellowship. We want you to get the most out of service today, so we put some extra resources on bacc.cc live. Our simple notes and doodle notes make it easy to jot down scriptures, points, and thoughts, and then later in the week, reflect on and share with your friends. You can get these and other service resources at bacc.cc live. I wanted to remind you guys about the challenge we have going on, the BACC Songwriting Challenge. We're looking for original songs that can be sung together during one of our services. To participate, create your original song and upload your song to any platform that gives you a shareable link. Submit your song and lyrics to bacc.cc slash songwriting by February 28th. We will announce the winners on March 1st and prizes will be awarded for the top songs. And we look forward to hearing what you guys have in store. If you're looking to deepen your relationship with God and keep the new year going strong, check out deepspirituality.com for inspiring podcasts, videos, and Bible studies in order to keep your relationship with God strong throughout the new year. So before we get started, if you could just take a second to check to see if you're subscribed to our channel. A large percentage of our viewers aren't subscribed, and it's literally the best thing you could do to help our channel reach more people. Now with all that, let's get started with our lead ministers, Scott, Ray, and Sam. I'm Sam Manuel. Excited to be with you this morning. We want to thank you for tuning in to the live stream. Today, me, Scott Colvin, and Ray Kim will be teaching our live stream message. You know, our theme is the unity effect. We want to keep talking about the power of unity. You know, the world needs the power of unity right now. In Genesis 11, verse 6, it says, The Lord said, if it's one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. You know, unity is powerful. When we are unified, nothing is impossible. Great example of this is the movie Remember the Titans. Love the movie. It's about a football team that's facing racism and has to overcome racism and racial division to win a state title. It shows us the power of unity. It brought a whole city together. You know, when we're unified, it changes the world. And when we have unity in our relationships, changing the world is possible. Key is being unified on the right things. You know, we can be unified on a lot of different things. There's also some things we can't quite get unified on. Important that we look at the scriptures in the Bible to know what do we need to be unified on. You know, in the Bible, and especially when you read the book of Acts, the men and women shook up the world because they were unified in prayer. They were unified on their purpose and they were unified on their convictions. Again, they were unified in prayer, they were unified on their convictions, and they were unified on their purpose. You know, these are three points of unity we want to discuss today. You know, my point is prayer unifies. I want to start in Mark 1 verse 35. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. You know, prayer empowered Jesus to keep doing what God wanted him to do. We learned something. Prayer unifies us with God. Why is prayer so powerful? Why is prayer so important? Because it unifies us with God. How? How does prayer unify us with God? Prayer is where we can work on our hearts with God so he can help us overcome things that maybe we get enslaved to or we have a hard time overcoming. Prayer is where we can cast our anxieties. You have a lot of anxieties? I'm an extremely anxious person. Just ask my wife. Ask my kids. I make all of them anxious with all the anxiety that I carry around. You know what I need God helping me to do to overcome my anxiety? He has to help me overcome my doubt. Well, what does doubt have to do with anxiety? When you carry around too much anxiety, it's because deep in our hearts, we don't know or fully believe that God cares. That's why he says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. When we have a lot of anxieties, part of the thing we need to overcome is doubt. We're having a hard time believing God cares. You know, we can find mercy when we pray to overcome guilt. We can find the strength to forgive others when we pray. We can overcome hurt feelings. We can get rid of bitterness instead of bringing it into the house. 
You know, when we pray, it can give us courage to overcome fear. You know, I'm naturally a fearful person. I remember when they first asked me to come into the ministry, I was like, are you kidding? That sounds like an incredible amount of responsibility. I don't know that I can do that. I remember playing for San Francisco 49ers preseason, got a chance to, uh, they called me and said, you're gonna be the starter. And I was like, no way. And I had just prayed, God, make me the starter. And as soon as they told me I was a starter, I got so afraid that I prayed to God, God, take me out of the starting position. I don't want to be in the starting position anymore. My life can be consumed by fear. It's why prayer is so important. Prayer is the one place I've learned to go to find courage, to keep facing things that are difficult, difficult emotions, difficult feelings, uh, uh, difficult circumstances, and keep finding power from God to overcome. You know, prayer helps us stay unified with God so we can keep loving and investing in people. You notice after Jesus got done praying, he said, let us go to other towns. I mean, Jesus had been serving. Jesus was preaching in the synagogue. After Jesus preached in the synagogue, he went to Peter's house. After he got done at Peter's house, he healed Peter's mom. When he got done healing Peter's mom, all the people in the city came and he healed all of them. You know, prayer really powered him so he could keep loving because the next day he woke up after he prayed and he said, man, let's go love some more people. You know, prayer makes us more loving. According to Dr. Carolyn Leaf, it has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. This type of prayer increases activity in brain areas associated with social interaction, compassion, and sensitivity to others. That's from how prayer changes the brain. Wow, think about it. Science is even recognizing prayer enables us to have more compassion so we can keep investing in our relationships. If you're having a hard time investing in relationships, being unified, I challenge you, check your prayer life. Take a moment. You go, I don't know how to pray. Neither did the disciples. That's why in Luke 11, they asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Praying is hard. Praying was very unnatural for me when I first started. When I started praying at first, I thought I was talking to myself. I thought I was talking to the four walls. We all have to learn to pray and keep learning to pray. It's not always natural. I encourage you, ask somebody to help you learn how to pray. If you go, all oh, this is foreign to me. I don't understand anything about prayer. Ask somebody, a friend, somebody close to you to go, can you teach me, show me how to pray my whole heart out? Because when we pray our whole heart out, when we work our heart out with God, what it does is it gives us the bandwidth to love each other in a far greater way. You know, for each of us this morning, how will we grow in our unity through prayer? How will we commit to being unified with God in a way that empowers us to love people in such a way that we see lives changed? And not only see lives changed, but that we also see the world changed. Hey guys, if you're anything like me, it can be tough working on and growing in friendships during this time when it's so easy to stay isolated. And if I'm honest, it can be tough working on and growing in friendships in general. I see how much transparency, love, and caring for others are important in my relationships, but I'm not always aware of what I need to do to grow in each of these areas. That's why I'm excited to talk about our new What Kind of Friend Am I personality quiz. After answering a few questions, you get matched up with a TV or movie character who shares some of your unity, strengths, and weaknesses. The quiz isn't meant to define you or be taken as fact, but it's just a fun way to reflect on areas of your heart that may be harder to see and to start an engaging discussion among friends. Like it says in Proverbs 27, verse 17 in the Amplified Version, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens and influences another through discussion. Talking about your results together can help spark these sharpening discussions and how prayer, purpose, and conviction can help you grow. Understanding who we are and what we bring to relationships can help us grow closer to our friends. And it's these conversations that unite us and make us better together. Today, I'm going to show you all that is possible when purpose and unity come together. I'm Scott Colvin, and I first want to thank our digital team for those great resources for after our live stream. Now, I want to start by asking all of us a question. Do you believe that God has designed a unique purpose for you? Let's look in Romans 8, 28 in the TPT. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. 
God is in the details. This says that God weaves every detail of our lives into a uniquely designed purpose that he has for us. Every experience, setback, success, passion, even our perceived liabilities and limitations, our, our sins, these aren't failures, but a part of God's designed purpose for us. You might have ADHD or, or be a single parent or struggling through learning difficulties. These challenges and those like them do not prevent us from our purpose, but are part of our purpose. I grew up in Flint, Michigan. I watched my mom battle cancer for the good part of her life. I would escape to sports. I'd go out running at 11 or 12 at night just to clear my head. I was basically just running off all of my emotions because I didn't want to deal with them. I really thought my purpose was to go to the Olympics. My plan was to run track at the University of North Carolina and then launch into an Olympic career. I'll never forget that first day I arrived in Chapel Hill and looked down on that Carolina blue track. I envisioned myself gliding over it, chariots of fire style, being the next Steve Prefontaine. I got to my first practice and I learned what real Olympic athletes were like. I felt like I was running in quicksand while these guys were just sailing along. I had a friend on the team. He wasn't even close to the best. But while I would sit and sulk after a bad race, I watched him on the bus rides home. His attitude was so great. No matter how he did, he made everybody else better. Needless to say, Olympic and collegiate glory were not part of my purpose. But while it felt like a failure, it was the start of a lifelong lesson that I'm still learning to this day to understand it isn't about being first and that God has a greater purpose than just personal success, and that admiring is better than competing. Look, it can be the letdown of a personal ambition or disappointment in dating or just the daily challenges of this crazy pandemic. God uses the details, every one of them, to shape his purpose for us. So don't let difficulty and disappointment, bitterness, drive out your belief that God has a unique purpose for your life. So what happens when we combine purpose and unity? Well, we've got to keep reading in verse 29 of Romans 8. It says, for he knew all about us before we were born and destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. God's ultimate destiny for us is to be like Jesus. He's constantly shaping us to become like Jesus. How Jesus cared for people, met their needs, loved them, changed their lives, his personality, all the hope that he gave, the impact he has. That's who God is shaping each one of us to be like. Now look, I will never be that much like Jesus. My non-Jesus attributes far overshadow anything in me that is like him. I'm not charismatic like him or bold or loving and let's not even talk about self-sacrificing. But there is a sliver, a speck of being like Jesus that's in me and in you. And when I join forces with my wife Margot, I get a serious upgrade in my Jesus-like qualities. And then when you add my kids and their creativity and all the qualities I've learned from them, more upgrades. Then when you add our family with the Kims and the Manuels and all of our friends all together and take all of their Jesus-like qualities, I'll tell you what, we're starting to become like Jesus. And when we're trying to live with that purpose together, we'll change lives like he did. We give hope like he did. And we'll love the lonely like he did. We'll do the good that he did. Lives are going to change. What happens is people see God in us together. Individually, maybe not so much. But unified together, yes, we can be like Jesus. What is our collective purpose? It's not just to build some church organization, but for people to see God in us. And that is going to change a lot of lives. Are you still trying to live like a Christian by yourself? 
we're headed for disappointment. We are in this thing together. So again, what's possible? When purpose and unity come together, a man named Gamaliel said it the best when he was talking about the disciples here in Acts chapter five. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. He says, look, if their purpose is from God, nothing will stop them. And anyone who fights against it will just be fighting God. So what's possible? When we have purpose and unity together, anything. So what do we need to do now? Pull together with people, your friends, your roommates, your family, your wife, after this on Zoom and ask the questions, who are we supposed to be together? What needs can we meet together? How can people see God in us? Well, there's no better way than to show you. Watch this best of segment of Glory Days and listen for a quote from Mike Mount. I guarantee you'll be inspired. Mike and Monty Mount and Tom and Connie Schaefernoff all empty nesters and proud grandparents who've never lost their belief they can change lives. We think Philemon 1-6 best illustrates the convictions these four live by. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Over the last few years, Connie and I have had the privilege of working with Michael and Monty to help our friends study the Bible and become Christians. Our neighbors, Nick and Norma, who I met out on a prayer walk. Nick had just had knee surgery, so I offered Tom's ice machine, and our friendship bloomed from there. Monty and I helped Nick's mom, Trish, become a Christian, our friend Kathy, and our friend Tina. A single dad, TJ, and a tech founder, Solomon. Also, Nick and Michael teamed up and helped Tim's dad, Howard, become a Christian, and Michael's longtime friend, Marcos, as well. During this same period of time, Michael and Monty had to deal with a significant health challenge that could have crushed their faith and turned them inward. But because Michael and Monty share their faith, they understand God's blessings outweigh life's challenges. Though their body is a bit slower, their heart is as young as it ever was. My vision for what retirement would look like was quickly changed when Michael was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease six years ago. I had to work through bitterness and anger and fear and the temptation to quit. I'm grateful Michael's heart inspired me not to quit. Parkinson's cannot take away our ability to love and serve others. We are still able to live our purpose together. As long as I'm here, I believe God wants to use me to help change people's lives. I'm very grateful since my diagnosis that God has allowed me to become friends and study the Bible with several men. These men have built my faith as well. God has also taught me the value of perseverance. Marcos, who recently became a Christian, has been a friend uh, for over 20 years. The scripture is true. Keep sharing your faith and God will keep showing you how good you have it. Wow, thank you, Tom and Connie, Mike and Monty. Your example of how to live your glory days is both inspiring and challenging. And what you've taught us is, sharing your faith is your best faith. And for the rest of us, thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on Glory Days. I'm Ray Kim, and I'm excited to be here with Sam and Scott as we've heard from them about how prayer and purpose unifies. You know, unity is fueled by conviction. Conviction changes lives, and changed lives change the world. This brings me to my point, conviction unifies. First Timothy 4.16 says, pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things, because if you do so, you will save both yourself and those who listen to you. Conviction is defined as a firmly held belief or the state of being convinced. It's an uncompromising and unwavering belief. It doesn't fluctuate based on emotions, circumstances, or opinions. You know, this scripture teaches us that convictions, conviction is not shown just by having the right belief or in just what we say or feel or how we behave, but the evidence of our conviction is in how our lives affect change in others. 
Making the Bible our standard means that we persevere in living out what the Bible teaches rather than giving in to our emotions and our opinions and our circumstances. It's loving others the way the Bible trains our hearts to love. This is what leads to lives being changed. You know, the world only changes when we choose to have and live with shared convictions from the Bible. You know, the, with the recent presidential inauguration, it reminded me of a story. In my senior year in high school, I ran for student council vice president of my high school. I wanted to be the VP. I wanted the perks of the status and the office without the actual decision-making responsibility of being the actual president of my student council. At that time, I had a large constituency of peers and friends who vowed to support me. Many told me I was favored to win. They had even uh, made up all these uh, slogans for me. They were saying, all the way with Ray, and a new day with Ray, and there's a ray of hope coming to school. And I thought, yes, I'm going to win this. Yet by the end of the day, I found out I would go on to lose the election. I missed out on the inauguration day I had totally fantasized about. And after I was totally distraught, and it dawned on me, it didn't matter how popular I was, but what mattered to my friends was that they really wanted someone with personal conviction that would actually affect real change, unified change for them in the school. See, I wanted a constituency. I didn't want to have conviction because I only cared about myself. I didn't care for anybody else and I didn't have any vision for anyone else. I just wanted to look as if I did. You know, we become hypocritical and religious looking like we believe, but not having the power to change people's lives when we don't have deep shared conviction from the Bible. First Thessalonians 1, 4 tells us more about this. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. Conviction is more than just words because it determines who we are and how we live, what kind of friend we are, what kind of life we live that inspires others, and ultimately what kind of effect we have on others wherever we live, wherever we work, or wherever we go together. First Thessalonians 1.8 continues about this. The message about the Lord rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. The news about your faithfulness to God has spread so that we don't even need to mention it. You know, the greatest evidence of deep conviction is not in how right I am or how much I'm mentioned, but in whose life I've changed. You know, what message, what kind of love, what impact is ringing out from your life? What's ringing out into the lives of others because of your deep conviction and your faithfulness to God? The unity effect is when we have shared conviction to love that unites people back together with God, with each other, and it leads to their lives being changed. It's bringing people back together in their marriages, in their families, in our communities, and even in the church because we believe that this is how the Bible calls us to live. Convictions change lives, and change lives change the world, and that's why conviction unifies. Acts 2 verse 42 shows us what this looks like. The community continually committed themselves to learning what the apostles taught them, gathering for fellowship, breaking bread, and praying. There was an intense sense of togetherness among all who believed. They shared all their material possessions and trust. They sold any possessions and goods that did not benefit the community and used the money to help everyone in need. They were unified as they worshiped at the temple day after day in homes. They broke bread and shared meals with glad and generous hearts. The new disciples praised God and they enjoyed the goodwill of all the people of the city. Day after day, the Lord added to their number everyone who was experiencing liberation. You know, this scripture shows us how an entire community and city of lives changed when we live with shared conviction. Because it's through these convictions that God creates a deep sense of togetherness that changes the world around us, that brings relations back together. Let's examine our convictions today. How can I and how can you have the unity effect through our life and relationships? From Acts 2, we see there's four key shared convictions. And I want to leave you with these questions so we can actually talk about these more today. Do I obey the Bible over my emotions and opinions? Do I prioritize fellowship, meaning engaging in spiritual relationships to influence me so I can learn and grow? Do I invest my time to be together with other people? 
And finally, do I rely on God in prayer to renew and get my heart unified with him and his purpose? At this time, we'll pray as we take communion. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the fact that, God, you have a vision and a purpose for our lives, and you provide us the convictions through which we can actually go out and bring a unity effect and changing people's, people's lives. Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross, for making it possible for us to have a personal relationship with you, for us to have a passionate purpose that he gives us because he's given us a brand new life and a, and a second chance at living a life not just for ourselves but for others. We pray that today they will help us to grow in our prayers, to grow in our passion for our purpose, and to grow in our convictions so that, God, we can actually change lives and build relationships and really affect change all around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've got a friend in me. You've got a friend in me. When the road is tough ahead and you're weak and weak in your mess one bed, you just remember what your old pal said. Yeah, you got a friend in me. Yeah, you got a friend in me. I feel good, good, good. I feel good, oh yes, my Lord. Because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good, 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 good. I feel peace, peace, peace. I feel peace, oh yes, my Lord, because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me feel peace, 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 peace. Some of the other folks might be a little bit smarter than I am, bigger and stronger too, but none of them will ever love you the way I do. It's me and you. As the years go by, a friendship will never die. You're gonna see it's our destiny. Yeah, you got a friend in me. Yeah, you got a friend in me. Yeah, you got a friend. Before we take contribution, I want to personally say thank you. Thanks for your vision and willingness to invest financially that has allowed us to grow our digital platform and make the good news accessible to more people at this time. We're making a difference. That's it for this uh, week's episode of our live stream. We want to encourage you, get on deep spirituality and get that uh, unity effect quiz and Zoom with your friends and in your households and let's discuss all of these things about the unity effect. Remember, subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit like. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thank you for watching our live stream service. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to stay updated on the latest styles. And show some love to Deep Spiritual.